We're rolling. <laughs> hey, this is Pontification Nation with David Pryor and <clears throat> Dallin Wilson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do week to week is discuss uh, books that we enjoyed. I don't know if it's week to week, actually. It'll probably uh, be. Uh, yeah, maybe bi weekly, but we are really going to push them out. Yeah, we're going to try to at least. Um, <clears throat> fair warning, spoilers. Spoiler alert! Yeah, we're we're this uh, sort of what this is going to be is um we're going to dissect parts or we're going to dissect books that we really enjoyed and um you can if you're an optimist you can look at this as an opportunity to sound smart at dinner parties if a certain book's brought up and you haven't read it you can pretend that you have thanks we to us read the book so you don't have to yeah there you go that's a good tagline for of us of course you could read the book yourself first and listen to this and I think that you would enjoy that thoroughly but we the whole point of this is to spoil it for you yeah. you can just admit that you're not going to read this 500 page novel 500 page novel as good as it is and you can just listen to this podcast instead and um it's 494 dude yes Jeez. but there's a lengthy afterward yeah that's true that's good though it's worth it the book <clears throat> in question by the way is the sparrow by maria mary doria russell i always do that i always i always, I always do maria dory russell Mary Doria Russell. Mary Doria Russell. Okay. So I'm going to pull up a quick biography of, of Miss, Mrs. Russell. Um, her website has a real – her website's really cute, actually. It's um, – <clears throat> if you look up her biography on there, which I have not done in a minute, but it's uh, it's about three paragraphs. One paragraph is about her. One paragraph is about her dog. And one paragraph is about her husband and her son, mm. which, you know, that's I think that's a that says something about her. Um, this was her first novel. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> she was a um, I'm pulling something up, so I hope I don't get this wrong. But she was an anthropologist, which is very clear when you read the novel. And there PhD. was D. Yep. Um, I'd like to get the specifics here. She. uh there uh, anyways i'm gonna just do this from memory she was up for some sort of promotion or position um and there was uh, i hope i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna get the specifics wrong but um she was uh because of um some sort of racial thing she was a white she's a white woman and i think they wanted to get more people of color in there and so they were gonna she was gonna get the job but it was like controversial so she decided to step down and she ended up writing this book um and all of those anthropological i don't know what the term is those studies that she had done um i'm obviously not a phd they came in handy for this because this is a book about um it was inspired, I think it, what was it, on the whatever anniversary of the Columbus? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, I'm a massive fan of uh, Damon Lindelof, who's a, a TV writer who was a co-creator of that show. He did The Leftovers, mm-hmm. uh, which I had you watch a little bit of. And um, uh, so he, I follow his Instagram page, and he posted that he was doing her podcast called Bookish. And I listened to that. And uh, I was like, okay, this is pretty interesting. So I listened to a few more of her episodes. And I forget who she was talking to, but um, <clears throat> I think it was Kate Walsh, the actress Kate Walsh. I could be wrong. It doesn't matter. Anyways, on one of those episodes, she they were talking about science fiction. And I hesitate to call this book a science fiction book. It, I, right. On te- technicalities, it might be. You, you would think it from, from the synopsis. Yeah. But it, I, I don't think. And this kind of will lead into – you giving the synopsis but she she was talking about how um it was very vague but she said i read this book called the sparrow i was i was working at our old job at the time i was doing a delivery and i was listening to this and she said i read this book called the sparrow and it's about this jesuit priest who goes to another planet and what happened to him and she described it as like something that happened to him psychologically spiritually and physically and what happened to him she, she had read it six years ago and she continued to think about it. She mm-hmm. said that every once in a while she'll still think about it. And I was like, wow. Like, they, and it just, I didn't even think about reading it. I think I looked it up online and then it just kind of circled around in my head. And I was like, okay, I'm going to read it. And um, so I bought it and I read it. And uh, it, I've kind of been on a, 
on it, not to get too personal, but I've been on a spiritual journey sort of in the last year or so, um, and kind of trying to find my place in the spiritual world and what I believe and you know, and, and this book is definitely, in my opinion, <clears throat> as you read it, you can kind of see that the author is doing the same thing. And we watched an interview right before this where she kind of admits to that. <clears throat> her son was born during uh, her writing of this, and, and she converted to Judaism. She was raised Catholic, uh, became an atheist at 15, and then at 35 um, converted to Judaism uh, when her son was born. would be impossible not to confront those questions when writing this book because that's essentially what the, the theme of the book is, is finding God. It's, uh, it's about a Jesuit priest, like, like David said, who is, from my understanding, sort of a subsect of Catholicism. Um, Pope Francis is a Jesuit, um, very strict, very devoted very into scientific manners and when a character from her book called Jimmy f receives a signal from another star system in the neighboring galaxy where does Jimmy work he, he he's an astronomer he works at uh, uh, SETI SETI where they do SETI yes. which is a real place a big in Puerto giant, Rico uh, <clears throat> the Arecibo satellite dish. Ar array. yes Arecibo that's what the movie contact Carl Sagan contact that yes, was about SETI as well yeah. Um, but um, that's another book we could read at some point. I would love to. And Carl Sagan is the author. But he, it's about a Jesuit priest, a, a Catholic priest, who um, is the first man to step foot on this an, an, an alien planet discovered by way of a radio transmission that was playing a beautiful alien music. So, an astronomer who is friends of our protagonist, the main character, Emilio, um, Johnny. The uh, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy Quinn, Jimmy Quinn, the the protagonist. Um, so he finds the signal, and um, everything is changed. Instead of uh, it being reported right away to the governments of the world. By the way, this book is written um, 1996. In 1996, but the setting was 2019. 2019, when when they first started discovering. Um, the signal so, so now it's in the near future but yes and this book was written like now <clears throat> it's like in a few months from now yeah um so obviously she she had imagined technology progressing faster but that's that's the safe side i think of, she got a lot right too. she did she did we'll talk about that but um after discovering this signal the idea is that the first group to me and it does make sense that would respond would be a um a religious a group the um the jesuits decide to send out a party a, a missionary party but also just a party to explore and to meet and to glorify god emilio sandos is the protagonist he's the one who is important because he's a linguist and he ends up being able to speak this language of the aliens it's <laughs> okay so transmission is received they send out a mission to Rakat, the alien R-A-K-H-A-T. H-A-T. Uh, I think it's Rakat because of the H, but it can definitely be said the other, uh, Rakat, or uh, very good. should probably have looked up the way she says it all. But um, they they get there. It's It's close enough. They travel there, and they meet the alien species they they spend some time with them it is is quite quite a journey but first and foremost it's a journey of a man who who meets god and as can we can we stop there real quick yes i want to read the prologue and that's a good I'll, idea because because <clears throat> this is the theme not the synopsis it's a very big story to try to uh yeah because things get well i'm gonna read the prologue real quick and then uh and then we can continue okay It was predictable in hindsight. Everything about the history of the Society of Jesus bespoke deft and efficient action, exploration, and research. During what Europeans were pleased to call the Age of Discovery, Jesuit priests were never more than a year or two behind the men who made initial contact with previously unknown peoples. Indeed, Jesuits were often the vanguard of exploration. That's funny. The United Nations required required years to come to a decision that the Society of Jesus reached in 10 days. In New York, diplomats debated long and hard with many recesses and tablings of the issue whether and why human resources resources 
should be expended in an attempt to contact the world that would become known as Raquette when there, sorry, when there were so many pressing needs on Earth. In Rome, the questions were not whether or why, but how soon the mission could be attempted and whom to send. The society asked leave of no temporal government. It acted on its own principles, with its own assets, on papal authority. The mission to Raquette was undertaken not so much secretly as privately, a fine distinction but one that the society felt no compulsion to explain or justify when the news broke several years later. The Jesuit scientists went to learn, not to proselytize. They went so that they might come to know and love God's other children. They went for the reason Jesuits have always gone to the farthest frontiers of human exploration. They went ad majorum, de glorium, which I think means for the greater glory of God. They meant no harm. They meant no harm. And I, the reason I asked you to be vague is because I, you know, and we'll get specific here in a minute, but like, if I can just add my own little addendum to what you were saying, um, it it's kind of a, the, the title, The Sparrow, um, comes from a verse in Matthew. Um, uh, do you remember what it was? No. I should. I just finished it today. Yeah, it's okay. It's um, it's it's the the theme of the book is something very small, which is uh, you know, why does God? Oh yeah. yeah if God yeah, exists, yes, why yes, do why do bad things happen? Not okay. It's a yeah. It's Matthew ten verse twenty nine. Not one sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. That's where the title comes from. And uh, so they get to this planet, and then things are going really well. Really well. Really well. well. Surprisingly well. And the mission, everything that happens from getting the signal to the the people that end up going, everything is just clicking into place in a way that's almost weird. It's eerie. When you read it in the book, you can almost go, okay, like, give me a break. Um, and they acknowledge this in the book. The way that the, the one of the characters um, says it is sometimes you just find a turtle sitting on top of a fence post. Uh, how else could the turtle have gone on top of the fence post if God didn't put it there? Yeah, and so they, they keep finding turtles. Um, and and to the reader, it, 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 if I might criticize just a little bit, it, and I think this is other reviewers have mentioned. I think you called the they they said hand wavy, so it sort of seems as if she's she's writing easily and conveniently because things are falling into place for this mission to take place. But something I do try to remember is it was written in the future. So technology has advanced, and um, it's uh, yeah. There's a, there's a lot to consider, but they they definitely they they get to this planet, and um, it's it's what happens there that we learn that that the the main character Emilio becomes a broken man, and half the book is written in the past tense as um, the Jesuit party and the leadership trying to figure out and and interrogate him essentially on what happened. Because Emilio is the sole survivor over the course yeah, of the book, it jumps back and forth. Like I, th- the it starts off in the year twenty sixty. That's two zero six zero, and um, <clears throat> the father general of the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus at the time, basically hires out a group, a small group of other Jesuit priests that he feels would be uh, beneficial in this. Um, I feel like interrogation might be a harsh word, but this uh, kind of uh, inquiry into what happened, they, they, you, you, all you know is that Emilio is back. Um, uh, the United Nations went out to send a party to Rakat. They find Emilio in what is clearly a brothel, mm-hmm. and he's killed a child, <clears throat> and that's all they know. And his hands are deformed. They're yes. mangled. They're torn apart. Um, Fingers are long, flappy. Yeah, the tissue in his fingers were ripped apart. Um, he, he's, I mean, he's, a, he's, a, any, any, I would not have held on as strongly as he oh, did. He's, he's a broken man in every he's sense of the word. He's a broken man. Like every he, sense he's, of the word. He vomits. He wakes up in the middle of the night vomiting from night terrors. Um, I mean, just in the, I think in the first chapter, uh, Brother Edward Bear closes the door so th- on, in a, on Emilio's room so that he wouldn't wake up to the noise outside his room and it just as- describes it as he never made that mistake again because yeah. not only can Emilio not open a door at that time because his hands are mangled but he can't I mean he, he's like a terrified child um, so it jumps back and forth between these two time timelines and you and so you're you see him at the end of it 
at the beginning of the story, but like in the future in 2060 as just this guy who has killed a child and who was found in a brothel and you don't know how he got there. And then it goes back to 2019 when he's, you know, a successful Jesuit priest who's done a lot of good in the world. He um, was raised in La Perla, Puerto Rico. And uh, he, he found the Catholic Church. He found religion, so to speak, because he was raised in a broken home in a broken neighborhood and uh, was surrounded by drugs and gangs. And, um, and yeah, he's sort of D.W. Yarbrough, actually, mm-hmm. which was the father superior of the mission. He ended up being the father, the, basically the leader of the mission out there. Uh, kind of mentored him and brought him out of the slum. Okay, so let's start at, um, at how they all meet. Okay. Emilio meets Anne because he is teaching at a university. Oh, yeah. And he's teaching Latin, I believe, at a university. And he meets this, this middle-aged woman. I think she's 55 or something. Upper middle-aged woman. Silver hair. Silver hair, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, she, Anne she, Edwards. She, 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 yeah, Anne Edwards. She, she comes up after class one day and is um, a flirtatious but not in a – you know just in a joking kind of a way and she goes hey hey do you, would you like to come over for dinner with me and my husband Emilio goes over and meets meets George her husband and um they the three of them develop a relationship cut to he gets sent from the Jesuits uh sent him to Puerto Rico to work at a some kind of a mission out there to some sort of uh they're sending him all over the world yeah to, basically to learn languages and sort uh, yeah sort of sort his, of the way that i his storyline is is that he he doesn't stay in one place they move him around too much to his annoyance but it is what it is and um this is kind of where it, it starts to go like okay is this happening for a reason so he gets sent down to puerto rico and um he and edwards is a doctor she's an anatomist i think is, mm-hmm. is the technical word yeah and george is an engineer and um he calls them and says hey i want you guys to come out here and work with me right yes and uh they hesitantly agree they go they uh, george had just retired yeah and they, they agree to go and jimmy and emilio they end up they meet I think uh they meet before Ann and George yeah. fly out there. And they're they're bar buddies. They go out right. and have beers. And um so J- Emilio is kind of the glue that holds the four of them together. They all start having dinner parties at Ann and George's house and all get to know each other. And uh then you meet Sophia. Yeah, Sophia Mendez. Sophia Mendez. And Sophia was a her story is really interesting. She, as a child, was a prostitute, prostitute. and uh, she was basically sold into intellectual indentured servitude where she was – her education was paid for on the basis that she would give a certain amount of her future income to the man who owns her until she paid off her debt. And uh, I think the author did a really good job of explaining that, and that was something I'd never heard of before. But did you see in the in the afterward that she mentions that something has been drafted, some yeah. sort of proposal where they're trying to draft this sort of an I uh, a concept into law, where instead of the student loan type uh, situation where all the government individuals could finance another individual's education and then be required to repay it by a percentage for who knows you know until until their debts are paid but yeah so sadly that might be like a, a that reality. might be coming true but so um she works she had worked with emilio previously she's an ai analyst um artificial intelligence analyst and she was trying to learn his method for learning languages for understanding and learning new languages so she had worked with him before and um coincidentally she gets set up with jimmy because Jimmy works at the Arecibo dish at SETI, and she is tasked with setting up an AI. They call it a vulture that works with Jimmy and learning his um, 
his method of uh, all anything he does there. Part mo- part of which is um, understanding radio waves that come in that and you know filtering out what can be thrown out and what may or may not be an ET extraterrestrial. And uh, so all these people through these weird this weird confluence of events just come together. And um, so Sophia ends up meeting Anne, who asked her to come over for dinner one night. And then the five of them all sort of, they're just, you know, part of this thing. And one night they have this dinner party, and uh, it's going well. And Jimmy has this kind of schoolboy crush on Sophia and blah, blah, blah. And Emilio and Sophia start singing on a piano together, and it's just... I, I really enjoyed that scene, but yeah. Anyways, so the end of the night comes and uh, Jimmy can't sleep because he's super embarrassed about making an, you know, an ass out of himself. And because he can't sleep, he goes down to uh, work. He's like, I can't sleep. I'm just gonna go to work. And um, he hears he hears a radio wave. He hears he catches a, a radio wave, and uh, it's it, he hears a song basically, and it's something unlike anything he'd ever heard before. Uh, and he interprets it as oh okay this might be the real deal and through whatever channels he can you know filter out however it is that they you know justify it being something from another planet you know going through different I mean as soon as they figure out that it's music and that it's not from earth it's yeah. like wow that seems like an alien so instead of sure. calling his superiors he he decide he calls Anne at 4 yeah. in the morning and he says hey um this is no joke. This happened. I want to talk. I wanted to tell my friends. I wanted to tell you first. I didn't want to, you know, this is a big deal. This is a, the first in human history. I wanted to tell my friends. So they all, you know, Anne, George, and... Um, Emilio. Uh, does Emilio go down there with him too? I think Sophia. Yeah, all of them do. Yeah. Anne, George, Sophia, and yeah, Emilio. They all, yeah, they all go to the dish. They all go to the dish, and then they hear it, and they're like, this music is beautiful, all that. Yeah. Look at the personalities that had discovered this. Sophia, and George, Jimmy, and Emilio, and look at the talents that these people could contribute to this mission. And it just turns out, this is sort of the hand wavy thing, is that, okay, yeah. well, this is going to be the team that goes. In addition to this, it's going to be a man named Mark Robichaud, who mm. is, he's an artist. A Frenchman. He's French. Alan Pace, and... Uh, D.W. Yabro. Who's uh, D.W. Yabro is a Texan. He's described as a very ugly, tall Texan. <laughs> very who, ugly, homely. Who uh, he's leading the mission. Yes. So they take off and they he used go to there. Be in the military. And um, things are going good. They 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 meet a a simple species. I'll put it that way. Called the Runa. And um, this isn't who was sending music right. and there were th- there was a discussion among the humans like okay how long you know as it would happen how long do we sit here and you know play house with these yes these runa uh, but I, that's one of my favorite parts of the books though is, is when they're living in that culture and learning the ways you know they spend months and months there yeah it's really really a, a cool a cool culture learning about it yeah and 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 so what happens is they they there was there's two species. I'm trying to think in my head how I want to do this. Um, so this is, this is what we're going to do. Okay, so they, there's two species, and you learn about the second one through this, this – I'm going to call him a man named Supari. S-U-P-A-A-R-I. You pronounce that however you want. He, he, he walks up, and, and you learn that he is a traitor, and he makes um, – okay, so the, the other species is called Jana, the Jana Atta. It's J-A-N-A. <clears throat> apostrophe A T A, and that's how I'm going to pronounce it. Okay, yep. um, so he's a traitor, and basically he was a third born, which means in in the Jana Atta, it's like the noble. It's a, it's a the hierarchy high-born species. The, yeah, they're the high born species. The Runa are a domesticated species, sort of like how we domesticated dogs, but they're equally as sentient, maybe slightly less so. Maybe slightly less, but they even look. They look similar. There's an even crazy reason for that as well, though. Yeah. Um, 
It, okay. Yeah, it's it's hard to know what so to get this into. Book is really hard, man. There's like this whole alien s- culture, civilization, ecosystem that's happening. They arrive- Let's just get into it. Yeah. So basically, the 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 Jana Atta and the Runa evolved together, and I think what she want the author wanted to do was she she because hominids, early humans existed with Neanderthals probably. Yes. Um. So she wanted to say, okay, well, what if they existed together and then. One spe- the dominant species decided to not let the other one, the other species, go extinct. So the Jana Atta, which is let's, if if you're listening to this, the Jana Atta were the dominant species. The Runa were the prey species. The predator and the prey. The predator and the prey. So the Jana Atta decided not to kill off the Runa. Basically, they set up this thing where the Jana Atta were four percent to the Runa species. So. They instead of just killing them off, they have this system that is very, um, it's it's specifically calibrated, it's and in the same way that <clears throat> natural predators and preys tend to equalize is a four percent to ninety six percent ratio. Okay, I didn't know that. Is that in the book? They do mention it. Okay, um, and the runa exists for a lot of reasons. They exist for trade. We're gonna get into who Supari is in a minute, but they yeah they exist for trade. They exist for sex. Yep. They they can um they can have sex with Runa and I don't think they can. You've read this more recently. Yeah, but I, I don't think no they can. risk of of pregnancy yeah. and and even diseases. There's no diseases because these species are, are are closely related. They look even they look the same. Uh, the males of one look like the females of of the. Uh, she alludes to they they look the same because of the way they evolved. The Jana because evolved so they a can blend way in this clothes yeah this this like a. Uh, cloaking mechanism they evolved to look like the smaller females of the group and they look so much like that they would join their group and you and use that tactic to hunt within the group yeah they take take down smaller females within so, the group. so they groom the jana ought to groom runa to to have sex with them the, so that the third bo- second and third boards and we'll get into that in a minute or we'll try to second and third boards can uh can have sex the, with them the third born the second is still allowed a family that, okay, that's true. So the thirdborn can have sex with them without risk of, of having children. Because um, they're not allowed to. They're not allowed to. We'll get into that. Uh, they can eat them. They eat Runa. That's yes, the meat that's that they the other eat. part that you find out that is pretty dark. So they're not only raising them up and using them for labor in sort of this kind of messed up evolutionary servitude sort of way, but they're also raising them to feed the rest of the planet. Yeah. So they're like people that are just raised for their meat. Yeah. Sometimes they're raised for their meat. Sometimes they're raised to be concubines, like you said. Sometimes they're raised to be, like uh, the the workers are bigger and stronger because they've they've brought these lines down, just like we do with dogs. Just like it we would do with be dogs. like if it. I mean, it's it's hard to give. It makes sense. It makes That's sense. That's what I kept thinking yeah. this whole time in this messed up alien society that she, she had. Well, and, 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 and not messed up, but just different. There, there is this. There it is a. Sense. There is almost like the question of. And. Th- so what I want to do is I, w- I want to get through the synopsis and then I want to get into the themes because that's where you and I are really going to go off. Yeah. But the, uh, one, I apologize. It, I apologize. We're tragic. But it's a very complex book. It's we may have. Really I think we're going to have to edit some of this, but that's okay. I you know, I think. So basically, it it, it would, it makes you ask the question like, we on earth have poverty and we have children dying in the streets, and I think Emilio even sort of alludes to this. He's like. Are we so much better because they kill children? Like the Jana Atta will kill Runa yes. children. Yes. And uh, that we'll get into that. And in that's part of the thing that sets off the whole problem in the next book. I understand. It's... Yeah, yeah. And I'll I'll leave a cliffhanger at the end of this for that, or I'll try to. Um, but the uh, the so I mean they they kill off Runa children to keep you know the ecosystem alive or to keep thriving. That balance to keep the balance. That's the word balance. Um. So, anyways, the way you become introduced to the Jana Atta is through um, a man. I'm gonna call him a man named Supari, and he's a trader that comes in and he sees the foreigners, the humans, and he sees them as like uh, he doesn't know what they are. So his you know instinct goes off and his predator instinct goes off and he he attacks one of them. He attacks an Emilio. Yeah. Which is funny because Emilio is described as a very small man, very small. Good looking, but small, skinny. He man. just had his back to him, though, so he was the. And he turned around and he just pinned him to the ground. And um, 
that was one unbelievable part of the story for me. But yeah. Oh, well, anyway, he was born. He was raised because these Portland. aliens apparently uh, are very tall. Like they're giant. I yep. would say seven or eight. Giant tall might be an exaggeration, but yeah. Um. And uh, anyway, they get friendly, and you learn that Supari is a traitor, and he they have a they have an economy that is similar to a capitalist economy. Similar. I mean, not exact, but similar in the in the way that they trade, and their economy, their market is based off of smells. Yeah, the John Ots really economy. I like that part of it actually, because it, it doesn't make sense because there's so many animals, you know, dogs, and not just that that we know of that have these highly tuned sense of smells. Yeah, so it, it's pr- I'm sure it's not that far of a stretch to think a sentient species would also have one. The most interesting thing about it, though, is is how they, or to me, is is like um, he gets into, he realizes that human beings have a commodity, and as a trader, yeah. he's like, okay, I can use this to my advantage as as a as a trader as a businessman it so becomes to speak. obvious because they the uh, coffee the coffee coffee so so one one interesting like characteristic characteristic of uh, sophia is that she is addicted to turkish coffee mm-hmm. so they bring coffee she and she uh, to bring it along they hate you know by the way I mean, come on of course you're going to bring coffee whenever yeah. you go anyways so they uh he he hates the taste but he loves the smell of coffee and so there's there are these scents like they bring sage. I think they they talk sage, about sage, clove, cumin. There are different things that they bring along, and and they they are and scent that based makes Supari species. a very wealthy man because yeah. he's he he works with the humans because he's willing to work with the with the Runa as well, and because he's a third, it's a very complex uh, dynastic family um, of of the the more advanced the the Janaata. Basically, the firstborn is going to be sent to the military. Straight off the bat, they're the military leaders, they're the soldiers, they're the guards, they're the the protectors of the realm, or whatever you want to call it. The the the, the second born is bureaucratic, so they're born into government. They they re, they lead, they rule, they make decisions. After that, you're on your own. You you have to make your own. Your backup, your vice president. You're just there in case one of your older brother dies. Yeah, and, and you're not allowed to have children. And you are not allowed to to make children. And that's unless part of... you can. Prove your worth to a member of the royal family, which does play a big part in yeah. this story. Near yeah, the yeah, end. yeah. So let's continue on. Uh, that's an input. Put if you're listening, put a pin in that. Put a pin in that. That's an important point. You, yeah, huh. you did a better job of explaining that than I would have. Well, I just read it. Yeah. So, um, so, so they meet this guy, and they're like, "Okay, this is our ticket to get in and find out where this music is coming from." So they uh, they bug him about it. There's, Let's... there's also this other problem where um, there's an issue, but they use too much flu. Uh, they Ooh. use too much fuel in the lander, so they can't get back to their space station. Which describe is... describe describe that scene the... with Sophia. So so that scene made me tear up. So man. they they pack a uh, yeah that was really really powerful. I was just like oh my I felt that sort of shock with everybody. So so they have an ultralight, which is a very small. I've I've seen an ultralight in flight. They're they're easy to fly, you know. Um, but they use that for some ground reconnaissance and to check out the area and to travel. I didn't know that was a real thing. Yeah, oh yeah, it's a, it's a real thing. I've I've, I've seen them. They're they they look really fun because you kind of fly just a few hundred feet above the ground. They don't look too terribly dangerous, but they take an ultralight and they go back to the where the lander um, is because it's not exactly they're not camping there the whole time and. They mistakenly think that the runway is clear enough to land. The, it is not. And some vines catch the the plane, and the whole thing just smashes to pieces. And two of the characters do survive the crash, but with their ultralight destroyed, they decide to drive or fly the lander from their landing site to where they're camping. And in doing that, because they don't go up to the lander to refuel first, they use up so much fuel that they know they're not going to be able to reach the lander that's floating in the atmosphere again and therefore never ever leave the planet so there's a point in the book in other words they're stuck there they realize that they don't have fuel to get up to where, where they land the orbit and everyone's space. happy to see them that they survived and then <laughs> he goes how much fuel is left <laughs> it's not enough well so, there's a beautiful scene where dw yarborough the the leader of this expedition looks at sophia and he says honey in his texas accent or whatever he was honey it's my fault and she goes what and he goes i'm just i'm, I'm remembering this yeah, yeah. memory and he says like it's it's my fault i didn't tell you and she's like what what and he's like honey how much fuel is left 
And she just puts her hands to her mouth Instantly, and starts crying. Everybody. Because Sophia's brilliant. Like, and this is, to me, she's one of the characters that is so unlikely because she's, she's like a genius, you know, she's like, she's so smart. She's too smart. But, um, for her to have made a mistake like this is very like m- mortal and, and it, 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 it's, it's uncharacteristic. Yeah. It, it is a, it is a turning point for her as well. And, but that's what, that's what drives them to want to get th- where they need to leave this relative Eden. I think they even call it an Eden probably um, because everything's, I mean, to go to an alien planet, to land, to meet the locals and to be accepted, to be given gifts and clothing and food and, have that be the, the end of it. I mean, that's that the trip went well, you know, but they know they're never going to be able to able to leave. So they need to find the more technologically advanced species to possibly help them make more fuel. I, I need to add something there. There, there are going to be little things that I need to add here because yeah. just for the second book, because there's breadcrumbs in this first book that lead into that. And you'll understand later. He hasn't read it yet. It's we'll get to it. But so, Jimmy Quinn, the tall guy who's tall been, ginger. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> tall ginger. It describes him as a raggedy and all, which I really like. Uh, Curly, a few times. red, uh, red ringlets. Probably not a good hair. looking guy. And yeah. Sophia's described as very small, very stunningly gorgeous. beautiful. So, uh, he he's kind of been had an infatuation with her this whole time. In fact, he has an interesting conversation with Emilio on the ship about how hard it is one of my favorite scenes in the book when yeah. he asks Emilio how he's celibate how do you do it man Dito Yarbrough's even looking good to me at this point <laughs> um but anyway so he 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 kind of this this is a part in the story where he kind of becomes a leader and um he grabs Sophia when she has this realization that she fucked up massively and he he holds her and he says welcome home and he gives yeah as in we you're, have everything we need we have everything we need here we're fine like we have friends we, we love each other we need to go we're back fine. you know and uh they they end up uh, having a, a, that, well, there's priests there. They get married. Yeah. On on. So, anyways, and then uh, she gets pregnant later on. Just to, just to go back real quick to what you were just talking about that scene where Jimmy, this young maybe late twenty something young, young virile guy, very tall. He's I read him to be at least almost as tall, maybe six eight six ten. Very tall, significantly taller than the others. Head and shoulders above the others. A very bright red hair, curly red hair. Um, one of my favorite characters, and that is one of my favorite scenes. He, he says, "How do you do it?" I'm sure it's marked in here, but I I've have got, it I've got a thousand. Um, and he, what 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 he had struck me because he he doesn't say, uh, you know, we're going. He, he's not alluding that he's some kind of um master for being able to control himself. Like he says, even priests have private lives, which is which is funny and true. But he also what struck me the most is he says, you and I aren't going through the same struggle. I'm doing this to myself for a reason. I'm doing it on purpose and you are being forced to withhold. So, um, and maybe you can find it there cause I'm not being super articulate, but I, I, I really liked that. He, that he mentioned that it's not the same fight as, you know, we're all struggling with our sexuality, I guess, but it's not, the, we're not having the same struggle. I can tell you, that in a survey of 500 celibates, 498 of them said that they masturbated. What about the other two? Elementary Watson. From their response, we may do we may deduce that they had no arms. <laughs> That's a quote. Ba- basically, him and Jimmy are having a conversation about um, Emilio and Jimmy. I got to be specific here. Uh, we're having a conversation. This is we're going back here a little bit, but back on the before they landed, he was asking he, Jimmy was asking Emilio how he lasted 25 years without having sex and he he's he basically tells him to masturbate he's like he's like take (laughs) Take care care of yourself yourself, take care of yourself and if just to the point to where it's it's not in the forefront of your mind but there's 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 all these themes that she it's a beautiful scene it really is addresses that are that are taboo but real you know for these priests to have to uh, face them and they do they have to face them in a big way she alludes to um the pedophilia issue in, in a very vague way at one point too, where she talks about uh, Emilio yeah. talks about how, like if you don't face the fact that yeah. you do have these cravings, then other things will happen. How, it, how some men hide them and then 
pretend. I don't remember the word she uses, but um, it, it he he talks about how it can get dark if you don't at least admit that you have these cravings. But and and I do want to get to the celibacy issue because it this book described it in a way that was that was made me understand it more than I ever had before. But I want to get through the um. I want to get through the synopsis real quick. Um, so they uh, they're stranded there, and they decide they're going to go and um, and see. They want to go see the city, the city of Gager, which is where uh, the it's it's a main city on this planet where um, they can hear the singers and. You read this part more recently than I did, so if you can talk about when they get on the boat and get there chronologically. Okay, so uh, what's his name? Supari. Yes, thank you. Supari takes them into the city. He agrees after almost a calendar year, uh, at least. Uh, uh, um. An alien year. I'm not even sure how long that is. He, he he spends a lot of time utilizing his monopoly over their their goods and everything. And when he finally decides that they're ready, he only takes four of them, three or four of them. He takes Jimmy, takes Alan, um, George, I believe, George as well. As well. And they go. Not to, Alan. Alan's dead. Yeah, we're sorry. Alan was the first one to die. Not unrelated to anything, as far as we know, on the planet. He just dies. Yeah, we can go back to that. Uh, yeah. Um, it's uh, th- that's how you mentioned it. So I'll just say it. Alan Pace is a guy who dies. You don't know the character that well. He dies, and I believe he dies so that the author can keep drama alive. Yeah, because you know in the beginning He's of the added book that as a last minute, as, as well. we said before, Amelia is a sole survivor, and so Alan dies almost immediately from probably eating something on yeah. the planet. And then I think that's how the author keeps the 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 suspense of the reader. Yeah, people just had to sort of start dropping. So that it starts with him. But um, uh, when they get to this planet, it's it's incredible as far as, as they can tell. Everything is, is beautiful and sort of what they expected it to be, a civilization that could actually make and create music and send radio signals. Uh, they describe it as a beautiful place. The food actually tastes good. The Runa could not make food that they could really palate very well. So it's more along what they were thinking and everything is going great they they have an amazing trip these these group of people but when they return um multiple characters have have died well you <laughs> learn that in the beginning of the book is that everybody's dead yes except for emilio he's the only he's the only survivor and he was in a brothel and he killed a child so how does emilio get there is that what you're asking me? Because no, no, no. How, what I'm asking is how do they get to – so we've gotten to the part where um, they found out that they're stranded. Explain when they when Supari takes them into the city for the first time. Yeah, they, and they, then, they do meet scientists, and um, they're able – by this time they spent so long there that most of them are pretty close to fluent in Runa, which is like the lower language. Ruanja. Thank you. And um, Kaysan is the – Kaysan, yeah. Is, is like the the higher, the higher speech yep. so they can all speak this lower speech and they're they're sort of using it to communicate with the scientists they find out they're going to be able to make more fluid or make more fuel um, and and they're optimistic about everything in fact the entire book is sort of optimistic up until this point but I, I just they spend a few days there and then they turn around and come back to find a few of the characters dead and then how did they die how did Anne die how did okay. uh, so D.W. Yarborough is the leader of the mission he's been sick for quite a while he has been dying slowly um, they're not sure why something maybe from the space sickness or something he ate something in the ecosystem he's not the they describe him as like a lean strong old racehorse um, he's healthy but he's older so you're expecting him to die Especially after Alan had had recently just died for no apparent reason, um, a- Anne decides to take D.W. on a walk because they know it's close, and they, I think she's just trying to, to connect with them one last time, and um, they go on a walk. But before D.W. can die peacefully, they're attacked by 
what is essentially a more barbaric version of the Jana Atta, right? It's a, they say that they're without homes. They're like bandits. They're like predators. They're more like animals. Well, they are Jana Atta by species. Right. That is their species. Right, but they, they, they have a different name for them because they live outside the city, and they're more like animals or at least like bandits and where they take advantage of and they, they hunt they're like violent gypsies they rip both of these characters to pieces they talk about limbs they find they talk about him arranging bodies together so they can bury bury the bodies but out of nowhere three of the characters are killed off by just like natural dangers at this point okay <laughs> so it, let's just get into it yeah. so so the, okay because we're gonna get to the singers yes but when we get there but chronologically the, bef- before emilio has to face what he faces what he faces he th- th- they, they come back to the runa and this is when you find out that that they're that they're hunting that they're eating the runa and that they kill their young part of what happens is the landing party give the people seeds and they teach them how to grow a farm Mm -hmm. or or, or crops. They teach them how to garden. And because of this, the lifestyle of the Runa changes. They start eating more. They they start having more babies. They have more free time and they start having more sex and having more babies than they are supposed to have, according to the Jana Atta and the balance of this ecosystem. So there's a, an explosion, like a baby boom. There's too mm-hmm. many babies. Right. So the Jana Atta send out their military per- police to silence the problem before it even takes hold. So they just start massacring children. And the, the Runa give up their children because they, they're used to it. They're groomed this way. They, they know. They're bred for this. Mm-hmm. So they know what's coming. So the military group comes up to this group of Runa, who is also sheltering Emilio, Jimmy, um, I want to say Edward. <laughs> it's not him. Um, Anne's husband, George. Thank you, George, and Mark. I'm a little fuzz. And Mark, and at this, they're much smaller than them, so they're sort of treated like children, except for yeah. Jimmy, who they think is an adult. Um, so they've got him in the center of the herd, um, with all the rest of the children. And when the military police come up, they just give the babies up. They give the young up. We we, uh, and they start to. To massacre them. Yeah, we need to bring up the part, and you read this more me- recent, this part more recently than I did. So I'm gonna, you tell me if I got get this wrong. But like, there was the part, and this is this needs to be mentioned. Just trust me on this for the next book. But like, Sophia yells out, yes. "We are many; they are few." Yes, in 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 the Runa language, she starts saying, "We are many, and they are few. We are many, and they are few." Like chanting it to where the other Runas there. Yeah, very super powerful. She's, she's scene. like because in that, and goes she's in, the first one to, I think, to break the lines or to run at them or to try to stop yeah. them. Or she, she. Is, this is flashbacks from her childhood for her. You know, and she's already had a messed up childhood and dealt with children dying and in yeah, prostitution. Yeah, she lived in a prostitution. You know, yeah. So she she does not stand for it and she's killed for it. Jimmy, who they were married by now, cuz she's pregnant. Fall in love, she's pregnant. Fights for her. He's killed as well. The two remaining members of the party now are, is our protagonist Emilio Sandos and one Mark Robicho, who's 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 also a, a parish or a a, a priest. So after after all the chaos, they're taken prisoner immediately and taken back to the capital city where they just come from. This beautiful sort of, you know, it's sort of like this utopian place. Very and they're wealthy being fed people. meat on the way. They're being fed meat and Mark refuses to eat the meat. And he, he, he realizes what's going yes, on. Yes, he's murmuring. He's murmuring something in French that Emilio later realizes, um, or I guess just a few hours, maybe a few days later, that he was saying les innocents. This every time they would eat, why won't you eat? Les innocents, and he he realizes that they're eating the young that they just killed, and that not only that, that that's how this ecosystem works. They this higher species raises a lower species who's not that much different from them, especially evolutionary, very close. And to that them. probably kept Emilio alive. Be- after learning that, he still eats the meat. He's S- too numb. Um, he, 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 he has a, sur- I, I interpret, this is where, okay. I'm j- just, 
this is where I'm going to be a little selfish with this podcast because I'm, I'm really going to be curious about what you thought about. I intentionally did not ask you questions about this part prior to this recording because – sorry. <laughs> I um, th- This is the – we're going to get into stuff where I'm going to just – I really want to talk about this because it get, this is where it really gets interesting. Um, we talked earlier about how um, there's this uh, – it's the turtle on a fence post thing. It just things keep going good, one thing after another. It's like it's it's God's purpose. There was a part in the book where he's holding a child. He's holding Askima, which is a, a little um, Runa child that Emilio got to know. And there, there's a scene. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Where he's he's holding her, and I think D.W. puts in his. Um, He's recording a signal that will go back to Earth, and he's saying, "I think I'm looking at a saint right now." He sees God in this man, right? But they send he sends back a report where he's basically putting Emilio Sandoz up as a candidate for sainthood. Yeah, because he's become in in, in the middle before all of this, before the deaths, the the two big deaths before Anne the the plane crash even but before that he's in this like enlightened state and he just believes that god has sent him here because all these unlikely things have happened good so things th- th- yeah um and at this point he's completely 100 percent giving up his faith to god and the fact where he's almost acting like a saint and that he's really confident in everything he does because he just believes god is going to take care and of he it. feels everything from him being a celibate from him uh, you know giving up these worldly pleasures and and uh, you know, he he. It describes him as feeling God's love and just accepting the world around him and giving his love to everybody else. And and he and is just living living in the moment, almost describing like an enlightened state. Yeah, like, like it gets like a drug experience, almost the way it's described. And um, and then things turn. They really do because after they disturb the balance and um, got themselves up into at this point um supari has taken him to the city shown him the w- the ways of, of this elder race the uh, the jana ata but he is he hasn't allowed any of them to be seen yeah he, okay, he has okay. yet to so, meet a jana ata that is not supari who is a third born who is different because so yeah so they, they so they're captured and uh they're eating runa me runa young right and then he supari finds them yes. and he takes the he takes mark and he takes emilio under his protection yes okay yes thank you yeah yes but yes he takes them under his protection and and this is this is sort of what i thought was a big part of of the book was his hands are so disfigured um and and it happens because of this because Supari decides Emilio's hands are disfigured. Uh, yeah, throughout the book, and you're you're like what in the few in the present tense in the present tense and for the sake of argument, present I mean 2060. Yes, because after he's back, he's on he's back, back on Earth after his journey. You learn that, and you learn this early on in the book that Emilio's hands are fucked up, like they're I mean, real disfigured. Yeah, they're they're the. It describes them as being the fingers are lengthened because the tissue in between each finger, and it, I, the way I, I've read it, and you correct me, please tell me if you read it differently. But the the meat in between the knuckles was was ripped out. I think they do talk about wounds between the fingers, but they they say that they very carefully they remove all of the connective tissues like around like around the knuckles and, and the palms okay. the palms is what she says and I, and I think all of the the lack of those connective tissues and it, she says that their her fi- his fingers more than doubled in length and it's in ba- the, what happened was he uh, Emilio as as the linguist is talking to Sapari and they're kind of discussing the situation and he says well and and the second book gets into this law a little bit more and what the, and how this why this law exists and that sort of a thing this is the i'm not even going to try to pronounce it but there there is this this ritual where uh it, it 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 there's an ivy that grows on a very strong branch and they make your hands look like this ivy and it basically is you are dependent on a stronger being a stronger branch sort of like a way of taking up this role in their society where he's saying that's a good way to put by it. By showing his hands 
are, are like this now. He has fully accepted his role, and he's a dependent of Supari. He lives in yep. his house. He's he's fed and fed and clothed every, everything. And there's honor. But he can't there's care. honor for that yeah. for the Jana Ata as well. And there and there and you can't care for yourself in the same way. But Emilio didn't understand no. what this meant, and 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 the uh, Supari didn't know what it was going to do to human beings either. Right, because they have a different a different biology. But because of a translation mistake by by. Um, by Emilio, he gives his consent to undergo this procedure for and, Mark, and he gives as well. it for Mark as well, and that is what eventually kills Mark. Weakened by the fact that he wouldn't eat the runa, he young. wasn't eating meat. He refused to eat it. He was weak. Um, after everything, he bled out and just died. If I remember through. correctly, yeah, he bleeds out. But it's a very powerful scene where Emilio comes to and eventually it demands to be taken to Mark's side so he can. And so Mark can confess to him, and he can they can do all the last rites and everything before he goes. And so it's, it's a powerful scene. But Mark Mark dies, and leaving Emilio, the lone survivor of this mission, the only human being on the planet, and in in the care of at this point a very wealthy and powerful man. Or, I I, or, I just I do want to be just say maybe. like I I think. Um, the the description of when that happened to his hands like it says that he went into shock midway through his left hand it described one thing that the just to horrify who if, if whoever's listening like all 10 of you just kidding the when it described how um when it described the the healing the itch that the healing had on yeah. him and and that i i just remember going my god like they had yeah they tie him down and they just he, he, they he, like he drives that, him crazy. They like that he's screaming though. They said like his they could tell he was strong because he was screaming and he's fighting. The other one was just he, this one is not strong. I like that too about the way they speak. This one, this one thinks. It's, yeah, it's a, ref, a reference to themselves. But I sort of like how it alludes to this bigger idea that they have. It's very they're very connected, and I like this uh, as a, as a quick divergence the runa these the lower class of these species she spends a lot of time where they're living together and he he loves this place and he loves these people he loves this little girl um askama As, askama who is his translator um but she more than that she lives with him a lot of the time they learn each other's language and, and it's this beautiful place more or less besides the the over you know the lurking power structure but they they wear ribbons in their hair and th they love scents and they're they're very colorful they don't wear a lot of clothing but they're always touching each other physical it's like constant it's mm -hmm. annoying to the humans because they're always hugging and just leaning and laying on each other and talking constant talking it's a very social group that she builds this world that to me by the end was convincing and looking at a story and that's why i was in the beginning sort of rough on her because it, it wasn't it didn't it wasn't realistic and she admits it she faces that head on says exactly and that's why they thought it was god so for me i i appreciated it i accepted it and she builds this whole planet that could exist somewhere you know theoretically um so so he loves these people but after his hands, he's alone on this alien planet with one person that he knows besides a, a few of the, the lower class. Um, he still hasn't given up his faith, though. No. Um, still putting all his faith in God. He still thinks that there's a purpose to what's going on. So despite his hands being mangled um, and, and messed up, he has his faith in God, but he spends a lot of time being completely useless in Supari's household. And eventually, Supari, well, he turns him in. <laughs> yeah, so he, he, and again, there's, there's, a, there's a scene that actually isn't in the Sparrow that they put into the Children of God, which is the next book that you don't you don't see in the sparrow that kind of explains it a little bit more you get to know supari uh, what was going on in his head a bit more um and the, there's a, a passage where you sort of learn why supari betrays i guess um emilio 
Yeah. So Supari, because he's a third born. Let's remember he can't have children. He's not allowed to have a children or a family or a legacy, and he wants that. So this is the climax of the book. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> oh my god! I didn't mean to do that. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name, but Hlavin. Hlavin. Yeah, I think. Kathiri is um, in a. Is, son, he's a royal third born. In a horrible, horrible. And he is the singer yes, in, in that a, they heard. I was going to say, in a horrible turn of irony. He S- is the singer. He's the turn. voice. Yeah, he's the voice that, that they heard. draws them to the planet in the first place. So um, he hears about these humans, these foreigners. Do you want to take it from there? Because um, Supari gifts him with some some of the coffee. He's a smart guy. He wants to get on, on Halavin's good guy because good he side. he's like, yeah, he's like, He's a third born, but he is essentially like a prince of the of the whatever the ruling class. Yeah, is. he's allowed to live. And it, again, in the second book, it gets a lot more into his uh, who who this guy is and the way that he lives. He's an extra. He's only there in case one of his older brother dies. But he's still royalty and one of the highest ranking members of this planet. So he's afforded whatever lifestyle he wants. He they try to make their own way, third borns, and be regarded for something where they can still contribute to society that's not their own children and their offspring. Uh, a lot of times they talk about them being scientists, but he is a poet and a singer, and a very cultured man. But he's got a lot of free time on his hands, and like any rich, uh, you, you know, billionaire playboy or however you want to look at it from um, from our planet, he he has his perversions. And he is needs his entertainment, and it, she she references that he is um, a bit of a sexual. He's based actually that character deviant almost is based on the Marquis de Sade. Do you know who that is? Mm-mm. Okay, we'll get into that in a minute. Then the Marquis, I I read that recently. Um, but just he's a fucked up historical figure. Like a, he was a real man that lived. But um, okay, so Amelia, uh, so. So, so Hlavin promises Supari that he can he has the right to have children with Hlavin's sister, which they reference oh, very really, yeah. really briefly. Like it's 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 one word. It's yeah. it's in the spe- I read it today or yes I read it last night. It's very brief and that again the second book gets more into that. But he said you can have like ha- go start a family. Go start a family something like that. Yeah, he he has the power to to make him a, what they call a founder. So Emilio is standing there in the middle of this room. His clothes are ripped off, and and Emilio in his head he's thinking, okay, well this is this is normal. Like of course I'm an alien. They're going to be interested in the he's anatomy. He's thinking of the human that this being. this man Clavin, this who's who's clearly uh, he's or he's got a giant headdress on. He's he's dressed like you know like an Egyptian pharaoh. Like they're very the ruling class is almost obnoxious with their like you know embroideries and their 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 fanciful things. And he imagines him. He says almost maybe even a prophet. He thinks. He he's about to start telling him about uh, the poetry, which is a reference which, to, to their their religious canon. He's trying. He was about formulating a sentence on what to tell him. We came from far away. We heard your beautiful music. Um, we sing about things that make us feel truth, and we call that God. We heard you singing this truth, and we thought you might know something like this. You might know a truth as well. That, that you call some we want to learn of your truth but before he can say this he's disrobed and Hlavin starts to circle him <laughs> predatorily I mean at first it looks like curiosity but w- one of the things that sticks out to me is uh, the Jana Atta have these instead of having dexterous fingers like the workers the, the other class does they have these three razor sharp claws and just to put in perspective Hlavin's personality he, he he's walking around him taking him in commenting on the beauty of the muscles and or something the symmetry and he just drags one of his claws across his back and just watches with interest as the the blood beads across his back like it's just this brand new species to him but instead of speaking about God having the climax of the book be Emilio getting all of this, you know, to come to a conclusion, he is instead mounted and raped by one Hlavin. 
not <laughs> one. He's he, he's he's right. shared with his friends. And, he's passed around. And you learn that the music was actually. Yes, that they often sing about. The, or, the concubines or he, that they have. The yeah, he, that they he have. sang about sex and about his concubines, and they wrote songs about Emilio. And in fact, when Emilio's telling his superiors about this later on Earth, he says, "I'm sure you guys have heard one or two of the songs, songs written about me. about me." And then, so my favorite part of the book is is is, is you know, and so when you're in past tense, past tense being their journey to this other planet, it's basically Emilio remembering and then telling parts of the story to uh, to this group of Jesuit priests in, in present time again present time being 2060 and uh, this all this the, the story just climaxes with uh, this um, confession that uh, one of my favorite characters we haven't even mentioned him the father general yes. of the Society of Jesus Vincenzo Giuliani who again I read him as Jeremy Irons yeah, I I I just thought that's that was... the way I went the rest of the book, man. It Did you? Looks like like a little. It described him as hair being a little darker and a little like shoulder length. He's described as being bald too in the beginning of the book, and he's described that way again in in the second book. But he uh he's just just this very strong willed man, and you you learn this again at the, and when when they they realized that he wasn't Emilio wasn't selling himself. He was right. He's he, accused of being a whore and a murderer because yeah. he's found in. Clavin's sex dungeon basically it's like it's a brothel uh, there's other people are allowed in it I guess yeah but, um, he's he's shared by the aristocracy even the guards um, and but brutally raped brutally, brutally raped. raped like the, it, it causes him he issues uh, yeah I mean like throughout on. the book he's you know in present day he's 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 waking up with and oh, man, vomiting I'm, I'm really like I mean, I just read this. So after you just finished it today, today. So after he, after he spends uh, weeks, months. I think he says months and months. He's he's raped on a semi regular basis. I mean, he's just becomes a, a horror, and you're trapped in the house, nowhere to go. Um. He also is being kept prisoner, essentially, and. He tells himself finally, breaking, that the next person who comes through the door, he'll kill. Because if he does that, they'll probably kill him. And that's the best way. How he can... it took him that long. This that says something about the character is that Emilio. You know, and I've said this to you just to take a quick pause because you're about to hit like a, a big note. This character, I think about this character. Me too. I, I sit and think about Emilio. I know. I just. I know. I just finished it. But the the morals of the story are. A lot. Uh, this is not a science fiction. That's it's philosophical. It's, like, it's it's a philosophical inquiry, and it's it's it asks questions about about God, but it, it it's so much more than that. It's it's human. It's the human psyche on display, and she puts him through. This, I wouldn't be as strong as he was. This There's horrible no experience, idea. and he survives. And and um, I would have been murderous f- way far back. Exactly. Or. Just end it yourself, but the faith, you know. He he really believed. So get yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted. So you, he's being held prisoner in this in this sort of sex den, and he he has come to be through with it, and he decides that the next person who comes to the door, because for months and months, time after time, the person who came to the door was the one who was going to either feed him or rape him yeah he didn't yeah know. yeah he did say it's, and, it's one and, or the other and it gets to a point to where like they get bored with him and it's just the guards that it's do just it. a few guards who are just messing with him now so yeah so that he like it just the novelty of it goes away i think is the way she describes yeah. it and he gets to that point and the door opens and at a full sprint the way i read it he's just sprinting he times it so when the person comes to the door he just flattens them into the stone wall um probably prepared to strangle them because i think he says he, he's thinking about the act of killing somebody with his own hands yeah but the person who came to the door or the individual is not a guard or somebody sent to feed him or to rape him but in fact it's oksana askama i always do that because that's like a like a russian name uh uh, it's it's Askama who's his his 
his guide, his translator, the his, child, the, the child, the child that he fell in that love he with, loves yeah. as a father. He almost becomes like her surrogate, human a father. surrogate father, because he's they're together for years, for years, yeah. and he crushes her into the wall instead. And she says M- Milo because she calls him yeah, Milo, Milo in English. Because she knows English, she, goes, she says something to the effect of like Milo. I told you your family. See, would come. See Milo, I told you your family would come. And behind her comes the delegation from Earth. Two, two that UN was delegates. Two UN delegates that were sent four years or so after they left to follow up on the mission, and they are the ones who find him in this state. And he's hysterical. He's, just he's, he's he's having discovered. He's got a collar around his neck. A jeweled collar. Yeah. Yeah. So it's obvious to see from the jeweled collar and the mess around that he's a he's a prostitute. So they see him and he's killed a child, and he's a prostitute. The pro- the child that who they brought there to save him. Yeah, you know the one that he loves. And, and so they basically they load him up on on his yeah. sh- they with, be- with no sort of intergalactic laws or anything besides the fact that who he killed was, um. You know, it's not like it was a Jana Atta or anything. So there, there's no law. So they're like, right. well, let's send them back to Earth and let them handle let's it. Hand, deal with it there. And so we don't know. So they throw him on the asteroid that they took there, but he's the only one left. They program it and they send him back to Earth. So he's got to spend six or eight months. Or probably, I, I probably like, I, I don't know, six months. However it takes long it is, at least for him to to get back. By and, the time he gets back, he's got scurvy, te- his teeth a lot of his teeth are missing, the re- the teeth that aren't missing are loose. Um he's he's fucked up. I mean, he's he's bruised, he's internal bleeding. I mean, he's just messed up. And that's how you find him at the beginning of the book cuz the beginning yeah. of the book starts there. And um this is the part I wanted to get to cuz you know, I I have thought about this book a lot. I thought, you know, it's it's this is probably my favorite novel. That's hard to say. There's a lot like Stephen King's The Stand, which we'll have to do at some point when you want to read a 1500-page book. I love that book too. There's there's, you know, Cormac McCarthy, Blood Meridian, like there's there's a bunch of shit, but this might be my favorite novel just because it's like man, I, the themes in it, like the way that it certain things are discussed and my favorite part was was the uh well it's hard to say my favorite part but the thing that comes to mind when i say that is is his confession at the end when the father general like he you know forces it out of him and if you if you can find it you should read you should read it because he when he says uh you know some of the other priests come to the father general after the confession and he goes you were too hard on him i can't believe you made him say that and he was like if if he was a painter i would make it make him paint it he's a linguist i made him say it he forces him in brutal detail to say what happened to him do you want to read it yeah go ahead so he has just admitted at long last that what has broken him because they, they knew what he was accused of but he admits that he was raped in fact he says right here this is this is this is really good I never imagined. Who could have imagined such a thing? I am in God's hands, I thought. I loved God, and I trusted in his love. Amusing, isn't it? I laid down all my defenses. I had nothing between me and what happened but the love of God, and I was raped. I was naked before God, and I was raped. Yeah, okay, so they, they, he, he confesses to this group of priests, um, one, one of which is John Candotti, who becomes his friend and his confessor. He kicks everybody out of the room. This, just to paint a picture. I'm going to paint a picture real quick here because I think we've done a bad job at that. There's this... The, the, they're in the Father General of the Je- of the Society of Jesus. They're in his office, which is a giant room in Naples, Italy, on uh, on the top floor with a giant desk worth... I think he describes it as... It's priceless. Mm. Giuliani is set... On figuring out what happens for the sake of the reputation of the Jesuits and Emilio's soul. And there's a part where he says, "For the sake of your soul, man, say it." And that, um, that right there. I mean, just as somebody who's raised in the church, to, to, that speaks volumes to me. But he, Emilio kicks over this priceless desk, and uh, just, I mean, he's he's he ends up shaking. And he, and he ends up saying it, and then he kicks everybody out of the room except for John. And he tells John then about, after he tells everybody about the rape, he tells John about Askima, which is what ultimately broke his heart, is this child dying. Um, and then 
uh, he does all this and uh, there's a couple passages I wanted to read um, this is uh, this is uh, the next morning this is the very end of the book this is the next morning Edward Bear his father brother Edward Bear was a uh, he was one of the priests at the I don't want to call it an inquisition it was at kind of a hearing it was sort yeah. of just a, an, a I guess an inquisition just has a bad but the the word itself is an inquiry it's not a hearing because it's, it's not a legal issue because it's uh, done they're just trying to figure balance. out what happened because there's liability issues you know there's all this there's a reputation but they want to know what happened so this is the next morning after after it happened and Emilio feels better he obviously well this this will this will say it he the sun was already f fairly high when Edward Bear awoke to the sound of a coffee cup rattling on a saucer. Blinking, he sat up in the wooden chair where he'd spent the night and groaned. He saw Emilio Santos standing by the night table, carefully setting the coffee down, the service releasing his grip almost as quickly as natural movement might have. And I should say, Emilio, uh, they developed these little machines, mechanical machines for his, uh, for his hands so that he could kind of work them. Um, what time is it? Ed asked, rubbing his neck. A little after eight, Sandoz told him. Wearing a t-shirt and a pair of baggy pants, he sat on the edge of his bed and watched Brother Edward stretch and scrub at his eyes with his pudgy hands. Thank you for staying with me. Brother Edward looked at him, sizing things up. How do you feel? Okay, Emilio said simply. I feel okay. Emilio stood and stepped over to the window, holding the curtain aside, but couldn't see much. Just the, just the garage and a little bit of hillside. I used, to be, I used to be a pretty fair middle-distance runner, he said conversationally. I did about half a kilometer this morning. Had to walk most of it. He shrugged. It's a start. It's a start, Edward Bear agreed. You did well with the coffee, too. Yeah, didn't crush the cup. Only spilled a little. He let the curtain fall. I'm going to get cleaned up. Need any help? No, thanks. I can manage. No anger, Brother Edward noticed. He watched Emilio open the drawer and pulled out clean clothes. It took a while, but he did fine. As Sandoz moved toward the door, Bred Brother Edward spoke again. It's not over, you know, he warned. You don't get over something like that all at once. Emilio stared at the floor for a while and then looked up. Yes, I know. He stood still a few moments and then asked, What were you before? A nurse? A therapist? Edward Bear snorted and reached for the coffee. Not even close. I was a stockbroker. I specialized in undervalued companies. He didn't expect Sandoz to understand. The generality of priests vowed to poverty or hopelessly ignorance of finance. It involved recognizing the worth of things that other people discounted. Sandoz didn't see the connection. Were you good at it? Oh yes, I was very good at it. Brother Edward held up his cup and said, Thanks for the coffee. He watched Sandoz go, then and then, sitting very still in silence, Edward Bear began his morning prayers. <clears throat> I wanted to read that part because uh, it it gave personality to somebody that was close to Emilio, but it also kind of showed that he, this isn't to say that he's a little bit healthier as a human being, Emilio, slightly. That's, I mean, you're gang raped by aliens, borderline bestiality. Um, you know, you're eating children and forced cannibal, all that stuff. But he's like, he, he's better than he was. I mean, he was inaudible in the beginning of the book. So, He's on this way. He's, he's, you know, and we'll read the second, but there's so much, there's shit I actually want to say about the second book, but I'm not going to, but, um, it's, it's mostly like the spiritual journey of this one man. It yeah. just tells this really messed up story of, of a first contact team that, like, I just could have gone so, so well, but, but the planet, it, it was such a, such a crazy place that they threw the balance off. And to me, I was expecting problems because it, it couldn't seem realistic without it but it's really about his his journey and, and uh and meeting god and she uh i said earlier it would be impossible to write this book and not um have a sort of to face it yourself to face that question with, about god um the same question that your protagonist that emilia was asking um and the the author had found that she was asking that question as well and uh, in particular in, in this passage um one of my favorite ones of the whole book after father alan pace dies the the character 
sort of introduced quickly dies without a real a real known reason um just an opportunity to discuss death to discuss god maybe but he says uh, mark robotro is the one giving the the eulogy it is the human condition to ask questions like Anne's last night and to receive no plain answers and Anne was asking why would god bring um why would god bring him all the way out here to die within a few weeks of his arrival and perhaps this is because we can't understand the answers because we are incapable of knowing god's ways and god's thoughts we are after all only very clever tailless primates doing the best we can but limited perhaps we must all own up to being agnostic unable to know the unknowable emilio's head came up and looked at mark his face very still Mark noted this and smiled, but continued, The Jewish sages tell tell us that God dances when his children defeat him in, in an argument. Yeah, I like that a lot. When they stand on their feet and use their minds. So questions like Anne's are worth asking. To ask them is a very fine kind of human behavior. If we keep demanding that God yield up his answers, perhaps someday we will understand them. And then we will become something more than clever apes, and we shall dance with God. I like how she calls us clever apes. I like how she calls us tailless primates because you've got to, in, even after the the journey through this book, even after, you know, it, what Emilio went through, he, he he doesn't say that God doesn't exist. He just he almost ends up hating God instead. In the end, it's um, he says either either God is real and he did all he did all the good that brought us here, then he also did the bad yeah. he's also responsible for what happened to me he's responsible for these deaths and that's a recurring theme in this book you know why does god Anne asks this a lot why does god get the credit when patients survive but doctors get the blame when they die yeah yeah but then the book takes it to the extreme oh man to the extreme that's worse than yeah and, you know i i spoke to my mom about this book i've there's a famous story um well it's not a famous story it's about famous people brad pitt tried to buy the rights to this book and he supposedly you can read this story on her website bought the sparrow for a, a bunch of people one year for christmas and um uh i thought that uh i forgot where i was going with that story <laughs> he honestly. was trying to buy the rights he was buying yeah I, I had a point to that regarding um she did not end up selling she him didn't the end up selling him the rights but um <laughs> Anyways, I was I, yeah, I was telling my mom about this because I was thinking about doing the same. I was thinking about buying this for a bunch. That was the point. I was trying to. I was thinking about doing this because I have a lot of religious people in my family, and I don't. Th this is the extreme. This Apparently, is the extreme test. This of faith. book is used now in Jesuit education of yeah. some sort. I don't know if it's like a wide. Well, the scale Pope had thing, it read to him, but the Pope had it read to him. Apparently, yeah. they uh, they assign it. I don't know if they assign it or they just recommend it to people to read. But it raises so many questions, and I really like that about the the Society of Jesus, whoever they are, that they that they would you know not try to I don't know suppress it or anything that that it raises questions and that they're okay with that because there's a lot that's been an issue with you know religion for me is the answers are filtered as they come down well especially you know and i'm not going to spoil anything but this the sparrow stands i almost wasn't going to read children of god um at least i was going to wait a while but the sparrow um the Sparrow is is definitely a standalone book. Like you can read it, and you don't need to read Volume Two. You don't necessarily need to. Um, but uh, it there it, it comes. It's a f more full story when you read Children of God. I finished it on the plane uh, from Austin last week, and I was like tearing up next to. I was in the very middle, and there were two people next to me. And I was like tearing up, like oh my gosh, because it 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 really brings the story of Emilio complete and and you learn and we'll discuss it i'm gonna i'm gonna buy it for you and we'll you you really learn like okay this is what the full story is and i'm i'm trying to be as vague as possible but um the the thing about the sparrow itself more than anything just as an isolated story is that it's uh it it and i i want to do a study on lamentations because apparently emilio is loosely based on jeremiah 
as I mentioned to you before this, but he, it, this is like the most extreme case. I mean, I, again, I was talking to this with my family down in Texas and, um, my brother-in-law, I mentioned that, you know, it, uh, the, he, he's kind of like Job too. Like yeah, if, you, if you know the story of Job, mm -hmm. like Job was just, I mean, he was, everything was taken from him. He, yeah, his physical body, his his wife, his family, his crops, his his finances, everything. And my brother in law was like, "Man, what happened to Job?" Was like, "I mean, that's intense." I was like, "This was worse. This was wor way, and in yeah. my opinion, way worse." I yeah. mean, this is horrific. It's not just like sad; it's horrific what happened to him. So it takes it's it's really like an example of a. I think I think that's what's so special about it. It's the it's it's a, a genuine like it's a genuine story about a spiritual struggle. But it's taken to the, it's taken to as far as you can go, hum, humanly possible, really. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of anything worse. I mean, you know, it was, it, it's not a horror movie. It was, it's not a horror book. It's not, no. a, you know, but it's not a science fiction either. It's this, like, just this, this anthropological, you know, religious existentialism question that she asks the whole time and it, it it makes you think man it really makes you think it, it, it has i've been reading it for like a week or whatever and it's been on my mind the whole time as might be expected from from when you're reading a novel but i just know it's not going to leave my head very quickly no no because there are so many scenes that are just so dark or beautiful or strange but to me, it all makes it seem that much more realistic and feasible, and that is very important to me as a reader. Um, I understand that can make, you can create a fictitious world and, and, and have all the rules abide within it, but she kept it within this world. She sent them off from planet Earth, and she did a good job overall. It was not what I was expecting. I mean, I knew that he's the only survivor early on because it's in the book, but you had also told me some of what he had been through. I knew that the climax essentially was that he was raped by an alien. And that was what I, I didn't think you were going to read it. We were in the car. I knew, uh, we were in the car driving and I had <laughs> mentioned the sparrow to you previously, just cause it, it was on my mind. Obviously it was on my mind a lot. And you yeah. know why now? But I, I mentioned, uh, Oh yeah, I had read a book about a guy who was, who was gang raped and you were, and then you were like in prison. And I was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, he was raped by aliens. And you're like, are you talking about the sparrow? Because I mentioned yeah. it a lot, and I was like, "Yeah." And then you went on this kind of joke about the alien penis, like, <laughs> and I was like, "It's not, no, it's not like that." <laughs> the alien penis, yeah, but from a sheet. But actually, it is, it is hidden. Anyway, she, she describes. Uh, I mean, if I like, she's not the best visual storyteller, and I will. Well, you compared that. her w midway through the book. Yes, you compared her to Rowling, but it's a different. It thing. is. I know it is. I know it is. And she's. It's more about characters. It's more about themes. It's more about. You know, definitely themes. more about themes. Beyond, I don't even have a beyond visual. What, exactly, she d hardly describes the. Characters. I don't know what Emilio looks like outside if he's a Puerto Rican, small, good-looking man. She with describes a beard. his beard that is conquistador esque. And so it just leads you beard. in p picturing like, you know. D.W. Arbor is ugly. Sophia Mendes is beautiful. beautiful. Anne Edwards is a fit middle-aged. Fit older woman. So George, George is, uh, might have had HIV, but he was just a long the distance aliens. <laughs> The aliens are so scarcely described. Yeah, like, they have two irises in their eyes and very heavily uh, lashed eyelids because their planet has three suns. It's a cool a cool ecosystem that that's going on three sunsets three different kinds of light she actually says that if our solar system if jupiter and saturn had a little bit more mass that they could have become stars yeah. and that we would be in a similar system but um she talks about science fiction in a way that to me is was too convenient was too easy i, I like pictures like especially when you arrive on a on an alien planet i mean what an opportunity to paint a picture she doesn't do it in the way where you get there and she just goes off on a chapter of describing things 
it's well, all about it's, the it, people's experience the with the book. with the, the stuff around. It's what they named the 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 little animals. It's what the people named the flowers. It's it, what it, the people experienced aiding them. It's it'll not, be it'll be interesting to do this podcast with you because you know we st- we yeah. You know, if you don't want me to say, edit it out, if you don't mean to say this, but I, I don't think you'll mind. I, one of the reasons we started doing this was because I, you know I've we I saw I saw a trailer for a movie called A Monster Calls in 2016. It was a good movie, but there was something about the trailer in the movie. I was at the theater with my ex girlfriend, and I was like, I saw the trailer, and then when we got out of the movie, I remembered the trailer, and I watched it at home a couple times. I was like, this is like an interesting idea for a movie. And then it's based on a book. So I bought the book. I have it right over there. It's a real quick – you could probably read it in like a couple hours. It's it's a it's a YA book, a uh, young adult book. It's real quick. And I, I just got into it. I cried reading that book. And, um, and then I just developed like this addiction to books after that. As an adult, I was like 20, 20 – I was about to turn 29. I was 28. You know, my 28th year. And, um, you know, I've read – a few different authors and there's just different types of storytelling you know and um hers is very much about themes and her her, her, her the way her characters see morality the she, human experience it's not very yeah. visual stephen king for instance is another author that i love but he's very visual very visual like he talks about um He's very sexual too. That's immediately where my mind went. I was describing a sex scene in my head whenever I said Stephen King, but he, he, he yeah, he's very visual. Um, he's he's very easy to read. There's my my favorite author is probably Cormac McCarthy. He uh, is very visual as well, but his visuals are all countryside. He doesn't describe the characters as much as he'll describe. You will know every piece of every grain of sand that's in the desert that he's describing but you watch a movie in your head you yeah, know? yeah yeah so it's it's just a different kind of writing different style of writing you know she spends a lot of time developing these characters i mean she spends like half a book before they even leave earth and honestly there's not a lot that goes on i mean some of it is spent uh except for when you're in present back. day yeah ex- when, when he's looking back and, and and so it will go like chapter by chapter it'll explain before the mission, during the mission, and after the mission. What did you enjoy more? Did you enjoy... I I really enjoyed... I think my favorite part of the book was, was the the inquiry hmm. with, with the priests. With Emilio in present day talking to him. I really enjoyed that because I enjoyed seeing Emilio... Um, having to, to face... Transform. I mean, he really... He's just such a broken man, and he just heals, you know, mentally, physically, and spiritually by the end. And it's I don't I wouldn't say he heals not fully, <laughs> but he he is on a path to healing. Yeah. yeah. Um. I I do like that part. I I actually really I like when they're on the planet and and they're with the Runa and they spend like at least a year there. And she she describes the ecosystem. She describes the ecology and uh, you know how they survive the, how they work their homes a little bit and i just really liked that whole picture that she sort of painted for me of this new species and this new planet it made me picture things that i don't normally do you know and i wanted more of that but again not the type of writer not the type to spend a lot of time d- dwelling on the on the on what the reader is seeing you sort of have to do that you have yeah. to use your imagination well i looked up artist renderings when i first read the sparrow i looked up what the jada Atta might have looked like i looked up i try to look up i've done that with a few books like just to see what other readers thought of and um maybe i should have because it was really complex and sort of I they're all bad have... though i didn't see anybody that was good i saw an artist rendering of emilio and it was terrible he was too young he was too tall he was too built. He just he was clean shaven. I was like, what? That's not how he's described at all. <laughs> not at all. Okay, I think that has been the first episode of Pontification Nation. We are going to continue reading good books so you don't have to, and describing them to you in as much detail. And um, this was our first episode. It will not be our last, but. We hope that you come back for another book, whether you read it 
or you let us read it for you. Um, I'm Dallin Wilson. I'm David Pryor. What's our email address to email us it if you have any questions? Pontification Nation Podcast, all the way written out at gmail.com. We also have a YouTube channel. Um, it's called Pontification Nation. That's all you got to look for. And we have a Facebook page. You can like us on there. And Instagram. We have an Instagram now as well. You'll get all the updates um, for when the next one is going to be posted. Um, hopefully bi weekly. But it, it, we, you got you to read a whole book, you know? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get it out as much as we can. It's all right. So signing off. Bye.